Hi, this is Ed Rudiger, and I am absolutely delighted you're tuning in to hear another one of my sermons. Now, I'm preaching this in my church in northwestern Pennsylvania. It's a little bitty town about 10 miles south of Clarion called Sligo. And my church is Sligo Presbyterian Church. And I'm preaching this message on August 25th. And it's part of a series we started a few weeks ago. So listen for the word of God. Now, as you may remember, two weeks ago, we started a new sermon series dealing with, what, with what's called the great ends of the church. Six ideas that the Presbyterian denomination has used for, oh, about 100 years to define its identity and its mission. And back on August 11th, we focused on the first one. Namely, the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humanity. And we spent some time talking about what it means and why it's important, and of course, how it, we might do it right here in Sligo, Pennsylvania. And then last week, we considered what it means to say that part of our job as a church is to provide the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God. And we considered that since we really do need one another both as uh, individuals and as, as a community, we can actually provide this shelter and nurture and fellowship by rejecting divisiveness and doing everything we can to build up the body, both here and around the world. Now, to this point, that's what we've done. And this morning, we're going to move on to great end number three the maintenance of divine worship. And I'll tell you from where I stand, not only is this the, the one thing that everybody both inside and outside assumes the church should be doing, I'm not sure anything has changed as much during my 30 years as a minister. I mean, when I got my first church way back in 1987, when it came to worship, we all kind of did the same thing. Uh, at least that was true in the Presbyterian Church. Now, I recognize that some congregations have always been more formal than others. Still, we all followed the same basic structure, you know, order. For example, we all sang pretty much the same hymns, often from the same books. And we all had the, the same kind of reading, some of them responsive, some of them unison. And we all prayed the same prayers and sang the same responses and often repeated the same creed. My goodness, as a kid, I, even before I could read, I remember becoming really excited in church because although I couldn't sing the, the hymns, I couldn't read them, I did know the doxology and the Gloria Patri, which we sang every single Sunday. And of course, when I was a little older, I can also remember seeing how fast I could pray the Lord's Prayer or recite the Apostles' Creed. You see, that's the way it was in the 1960s. And I'll tell you, it hadn't changed all that much when I served my first church in the 1980s. But since then, worship has changed a lot, hasn't it? And I don't think you need to be a theologian to understand why. I mean, although the formality we had in the past, the, the structure, the order, man, it means a lot to us. It's actually a turnoff for a lot of younger adults, particularly those who weren't raised in the church. For them, and I know this is going to be painful to hear, for them, our old favorites are just old. And the idea of reading out loud a whole bunch of stuff is kind of boring. And don't get me started on having to sit quietly and listen to sermons that go on and on and on. You see, many people nowadays are fed by something that's more relaxed and dynamic and frankly fun. They're seeking experiences, not just communities. And I'll tell you, I think that's caused a real divide in the body of Christ, you know, between the traditional and the contemporary. With some congregations going so far as to offer two absolutely separate services. 
So one group is protected from anything new, and the other group is protected from anything old. And in many places, bands have replaced pianos and organs, and smoke machines and lasers have been added to provide a little pizzazz. Now, that's life in the worship fast lane. And even though that kind of stuff makes me grumble, you know, makes me shake my head, man, it makes me talk about how we can go back, should be going back to a better time, let's reverse the, the, the clock so that we can regain the past. When I'm really honest with myself, I've got to admit there's nothing wrong with bands or pizzazz. Still, with all the different stuff that's going on with worship, somehow in the middle of this, I think we may have lost touch with what divine, the maintenance of divine worship is all about and why it's important and how it might be done, regardless of the style we happen to prefer. And I'll tell you, that's going to be our focus this morning. And hopefully by the end, at least as it relates to worship, we'll be able to look past the wrapping so that we can better appreciate what's inside the box. And you know, to do that, I think we need to be clear about what worship actually is. And, I'll know, and although I know there are all kinds of definitions out there, many of which are really, really good, I'm going to offer three characteristics of worship that make biblical sense to me. You see, first, I think worship is about praise. I mean, it's about us focusing our attention on God and sharing with him just how happy we are that he chose to make us his people and that he chose to redeem us through Jesus Christ and that he chose to open our eyes and our minds and our hearts by the Holy Spirit so that we can see and understand and trust. Put in a slightly different way, we praise God when we're thanking him for doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And I'll tell you, this kind of praise, offering praise, goes back to the way the people of Israel used to worship their God. For example, as they approached the temple there in Jerusalem, and the temple is that special place where God is, is present in a, in a more intimate way, this was the sort of thing they would say. This is what they'd say as they were approaching the temple. Shout praises to the Lord. Praise God in his temple. Praise him in heaven, his mighty fortress. Praise our God. His deeds are wonderful, too marvelous to describe. Praise God with trumpets and all kinds of harps. Praise him with tambourines and dancing, with stringed instruments and woodwinds. Praise God with cymbals, with clashing cymbals. Let every living creature praise the Lord, shout praises to the Lord. Now, although having trumpets and harps and woodwinds may be out of our price range, and I know the Gallagher girls would object to me dancing, that's exactly what the people of Israel did as they approached God. Why? Because first, worship is about praise. And second, I think it's also about prayer. In other words, it's about taking who we are. And I'm talking about what we think and feel, what we regret and fear, what we hope and dream. It's taking all these things and laying them before God. Trusting that God really is the one who deserves our thanks and praise. As a matter of fact, it's doing the same kind of thing Jesus taught his disciples to do when he said this to them. When you pray, don't be like those who show off, those show-offs who love to stand up and pray in the synagogue and on street corners. They do this just to look good. I can assure you they've already received their reward. When you pray, go into a room alone and close the door. Pray to your father in private. He knows what is done in private and will reward you. When you pray, don't talk on and on as people who don't know God. They think God likes to hear long prayers. Don't be like them. Your father knows what you need even before you ask. You should pray like this. Our father in heaven, help us honor your name. 
Come and set up your kingdom so everyone on earth will obey you as you are obeyed in heaven. Give us our food today. Forgive us for doing wrong as we forgive others. Keep us from being tempted and protect us from evil. Now this is really what it means to pray. The second thing that worship is all about. And third, I think it's also about preparation. You see, in my opinion, worship actually prepares us to leave worship, to leave this building, and to face all those challenges of living on the other side of the stained glass. In other words, worship gives us the ability to cope and to endure with hope, as well as the tools to roll up our sleeves and to get to work. I'll tell you, it's less like a drug that demands that we constantly come back for our next fix, and more like an exercise regimen that makes us a little bit stronger each and every time we come. And personally, I think that's what Paul was getting at when he wrote this to the Ephesians. God chose some of you to be apostles, prophets, missionaries, pastors, and teachers. So his people would, would learn to serve and his body would grow strong. This will continue until we are united by our faith and by our understanding of the Son of God. Then we will be mature just as Christ is and we will be completely like him. You see, along with praise and prayer right here and now, we're being prepared. And for me, that's what worship is all about. And why is it important? Why is it important for us to gather, to praise and to pray and to prepare? I mean, why is it important for us to take the time and make the effort to leave the mundane for just a little while so that we might enter the divine? Well, for me, I think the answer is pretty clear. I mean, on one hand, I think it connects us with God. Now, don't get me wrong, God is with us all the time. As a matter of fact, his presence is flowing around and through us. That's what the word omnipresent means. But I'll tell you, when we gather to worship, when we gather to praise and pray and prepare. I mean, when we're singing the songs and praying the prayers and when we're listening to the music and trying not to doze off during the sermon and certainly when we're gathered around the table and we're sharing the bread and the cup, we're connecting to God in a special way. Something I believe Jesus explained when he said this again to his disciples. I promise you God in heaven will allow whatever you allow on earth. But God will not allow anything you don't allow. I promise that when any two of you on earth agree about something you are praying for, my Father in heaven will do it for you. Whenever two or three of you come together in my name, I am there with you. You see, on one hand, worship connects us with God. On the other hand, though, I think it also connects us with one another. And I'll tell you, for me, that's why the gathering is important. You see, even though we can certainly praise and pray and prepare all by ourselves, I think we can eat. Even And I think we can even connect with God while streaming or watching a video or listening to a podcast. I think there's a real difference when we get together at the same place at the same time. I mean, when we're here worshiping God, we become more than a bunch of people. Man, we become a community. We become a family where we can offer comfort and support and strength to our brothers and sisters. And I'll tell you, I think that's probably why the writer of the letter to the Hebrews said this. So let's come near God with pure hearts and a confidence that comes from having faith. Let's keep our hearts pure, our consciences free from evil, and our bodies washed with clean water. We must hold tightly to the hope we say is ours. After all, we can trust the one who made the agreement with us. We should keep on encouraging each other to be thoughtful and to do helpful things. Some people have given up the habit of meeting for worship. But we must not do that. We should keep on encouraging each other, especially since you know the day of the Lord's coming is getting closer. 
I'll tell you, if you want to know why worship is important, well, for me, it's because in a special way, it connects us with God and with one another. And finally, how can it be done? How can worship with a focus on praise and prayer and preparation? And how can we do this most effectively because we know it's going to connect us to God and with one another in a special way? In other words, how might we maintain divine worship? Well, without getting into the weeds as a congregation, I think we can do two things. I mean, one, we can certainly provide a place. Now, I know that in our world, we're becoming increasingly digital. And personally, I think joining this communication revolution is an incredible way to share the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, to share this with people that are never going to walk into a church. As a matter of fact, I've said it once and I'll probably say it again. I believe the internet is for us what the Roman were, roads were for Paul. Still having said all that, if we're going to gather physically, man, we need a place, a place to praise and pray and prepare, a place to connect with God and one another. Of course, it doesn't have to be a church building. But I got to tell you, buildings are really nice and comfortable and convenient. But regardless of what it looks like or what it's called, we can provide a place for people to worship. Something that must be important to God because it's part of his instruction to his people as they were about to enter the promised land. He said, Soon you will cross the Jordan and the Lord will help you conquer your enemies and let you live in peace. There in the land he has given you. But after you have settled, life will be different. You must not offer sacrifices just anywhere you want to. Instead, the Lord will choose a place where in Israel you must go to worship him. All of your sacrifices and burnt offerings must be taken there, including sacrifices to please the Lord and any gift you promise or voluntarily give him. That's where you must also take one-tenth of your grain, wine, and olive oil, as well as your firstborn, the firstborn of your cattle, sheep, and goats. You and your family and servants must eat all your great gifts and sacrifices and celebrate there at the place of worship because the Lord your God has made you successful in everything you have done. And since Levites will not have any land of their own, you must ask some of them to come along and celebrate with you. You see, as a congregation, we can, provi we can provide a place for worship. And that's one thing we can do. But that's not all, because two, we can provide a path. And I'm talking about a process and a procedure by which we can approach God. And even though this may take different forms, because if in the, the last 30 years have taught us anything, when it comes to worship, one size doesn't fit all, still the focus and the goal really doesn't change. In other words, I believe that some structure is necessary as we approach God. Because let's face it, if we don't know where we're going, we're probably never going to get there. And I'll tell you, I think this need for some kind of focus and order was behind this advice Paul offered the church in Corinth. My friends, when you meet to worship, you must do everything for the good of everyone there. That's how it should be when someone sings or teaches or tells what God has said or speaks an unknown language or explains what the language means. No more than two or three of you should speak unknown languages during the meeting. You must take turns, and someone should always be there to explain what you mean. If no one can explain it, you must keep silent in church and speak only to yourself and to God. Two or three persons may prophesy, and everyone else must listen carefully. If someone sitting there receives a message from God, the speaker must stop and let the other person speak. Let only one person speak at a time. Then all of you will learn something and be encouraged. 
A prophet should be willing to stop and let someone else speak. God wants everything to be done peacefully and in order. You see, in my opinion, by providing a place and a path, that's how we as a congregation can maintain divine worship. Of course, I have no question in my mind that the form worship takes will continue to change. I mean, what was meaningful to baby boomers like me aren't necessarily meaningful to Gen X or to millennials, much less to Gen Z or, God help us, Generation Alpha. As the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, the only constant is change. And as I hold on to my old favorites with bloody fingernails, the way it used to be, the way God must want it because it's the way we did it in the 60s, I either need to accept it or be left behind. And that applies to worship just like it does to everything else. But I'll tell you, I think dealing with this kind of evolution just might be easier when we recognize that at its core, divine worship is about praise and prayer and preparation. And that regardless of the style, it's important because it connects us with God and with one another. And finally, that in spite of the details that might, based on a whole bunch of things, details we might like or not so much, as a congregation, we can provide both a place and a path. You see, for me, that's, what, that's the what and the why and the how involved in the maintenance of divine worship. Amen. Well, thanks for listening to the sermon. I hope you found it meaningful. Of course, if you're in, ever in the neighborhood... That's Sligo, Pennsylvania. And on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, come on by the church. The Sligo Presbyterian Church here in Sligo, Pennsylvania. That's about 10 miles south of Clarion. And Clarion's right on Interstate 80. Come, come on by and worship with us. I think you'll have a good time. Of course, if you're around here on a Wednesday morning at 1030 or a Thursday evening at 630, come on by and join in one of our Bible studies. And so until I talk with you again, I want you to remember, you, my friend, you are a child of God, and God loves you very much. Goodbye for now.